For this part of the lecture, I'd like to discuss atmosphere and ocean linkages. How are these two connected? Well, you have to remember that ocean currents are formed by the wind blowing over the water. It's the frictional drag of wind on water that produces ocean currents. Um, it's what produces waves as well, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So ocean currents, because they flow, are deflected by Coriolis. So you're going to see the movement of water mimicking the movement of the air. So for example, where we have the uh, subtropical high pressure systems, you're going to see water moving that same direction, that clockwise movement. And as a result of that, we have what are called gyres in all the world's oceans around those subtropical high pressure systems. A gyre is an enclosed circulation of water. Maybe you've heard of the Pacific garbage patch. Well, the, the garbage is caught in that circulation. There's also an Atlantic garbage patch. There's an Indian Ocean garbage patch. There's a Pacific Ocean. Uh, uh, southern, in, I should say in the southern hemisphere, there are also uh, garbage patches because the Pacific Ocean obviously is in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. So these are the major ocean currents. And what I would point out to you are the, the blue currents are cold ocean currents. Remember, these are ways that um, that the earth balances out the imbalances in uh, heat, bringing uh, heat from the tropics into these cooler areas and cold air from the polar areas into these warmer areas. So the blue arrows represent cold currents. Here's a cold current off the coast of northeastern uh, North America. And it has a name, it's called the Labrador Current. And then off the west coast, we have the California Current. So this, this circulation then shows these gyres. This is the Pacific Gyre, the North Pacific Gyre. Here's the South Pacific uh, Gyre, and pay attention to the different motion here because the, the uh, Coriolis deflection is different in the Southern Hemisphere than it is in the Northern Hemisphere. And then here's the Atlantic Gyre. So out here we have the Bermuda High, or in the wintertime the Azores High, in that clockwise circulation. And just so you won't forget, that is formed by the northeast trade winds and the polar westerlies. Northeast trade winds and the polar westerlies, that clockwise circulation. So again, look at how we, we start this flow to the north and then Coriolis is, deflects it. We also have the big old continent of North America here that's deflecting it too, but it would deflect anyway where, uh, because Coriolis. Um, the westward path blocked by continents forced northward along the eastern side and the fact that this warm current called the Gulf Stream brushes by Great Britain, the British Isles I should say, and Scandinavia, it makes these areas warmer than they would be otherwise. So here they are, the Gulf Stream here and then when it breaks off and heads over to the British Isles and Scandinavia, we call it the North Atlantic Drift. The North Atlantic Drift has had a lot of uh, influence on geopolitics. Uh, it keeps the Russian Navy, their submarine base in Murmansk, it allows them to keep it open during the winter time because that warmer water keeps these areas from freezing over. Otherwise, they would freeze over and they wouldn't be able to get their submarines out. Um, so that's why we have a lot of submarines playing war games up here around Iceland. If you've seen the Hunt for Red October, which I've seen about 500 times, then you know something about that. Then we have also um, part of that current, part of that gyre is the Canary Current, which brushes by uh, the Iberian Peninsula portions of North Africa. And then that gyre is completed by the North Equatorial Current. So the Gulf Stream, the Canary Current, and the North Equator uh, Equatorial Current. Over here in the Pacific, that gyre is formed by the California Current, the North Equatorial Current, 
then we jump over here to the other side of the globe, and the Kuroshio current, which is a warm current off Japan. Now, cold currents are way more nutrient rich than warm currents are. There's a lot of uh, little krill and plankton. These are nutrient rich waters. So they have traditionally been areas where we have these cold currents have traditionally been um, great fishing grounds. Here's the Labrador current, the Grand Banks, the, a huge fishing area uh, in the North Atlantic is um, fed by the Labrador current. So a lot of nutrients here that attracts fish. Same thing with the California current. We traditionally had a robust fishery here. Um, if, you, if you've been to Monterey, maybe you visited the canneries there, which are historic now because one of the things that we fish for uh, were sardines and they basically got fished out because they got overfished. Now, since we haven't been fishing for them so long, that population seems to be returning. But if we go to the southern hemisphere, here's the Peru current, a cold current. This one is implicated with El Nino, as, as we'll discuss a little later. The Benguela current here. So a couple of things here. Where you have waters where the cold currents and the warm currents kind of inter, I'm not going to say they interact with each other because cold water and warm water, they do not want to mix. They stay separate. But there's a lot of shoaling. So sandbars can build up. Um, and in the case of on this side in around North Carolina, where the Labrador current and the Gulf Stream meet up, um, that's called the graveyard of the Atlantic for all the shipwrecks that were here. And lots of shipwrecks down here off of South America and off of uh, uh, lots of shipwrecks down here in the southern part of, uh, of Africa where these two currents brush together. Um, waves can get really high as a result of what goes on here. The other thing that I'd like to point out here is where these cold currents are, they actually stabilize climate, stabilize weather, where you don't get a lot of rainfall. Cold temperatures inhibit the uplift of air. We need that uplift of air to get condensation, to get rain out of it. So we might get fog, but that's it. So we have the Atacama Desert here, one of the driest places in the world. We talked about how we have the Mojave and the Sonoran Deserts here. We have the Kalahari and the Namibia Deserts over here. And then, of course, here's the, uh, the Sahara Desert. Um, so there's that going on with cold currents. But there's another thing. There is a crop that does well in these climatic zones. Uh, they like fog. This crop likes the fog, but it doesn't like a lot of rain. So these areas are good grape growing regions. Uh, if you think about over here, French wines, Spanish wines, and then of course in California, we've got Napa and Sonoma, uh, Chilean wines, uh, we've got the uh, uh, Western Australia wines and also South African wines. So good for growing grapes where we have these cold currents. Uh, it produces the type of climate that grapes need. Uh, to grow well. And again, this, uh, this is just showing you those gyres once more. So the warm ocean currents then, the Gulf Stream, off the east coast of the U.S. deflects to the right because of Coriolis and flows off the coast of Great Britain and Scandinavia. And again, it, where it breaks away and flows past these areas, it's called the North Atlantic Drift. And it moderates the climate. And the Cornwall in England there are actually palm trees that grow there. They're spindly looking palm trees, but they're palm trees, which you wouldn't expect to see growing in Great Britain. Then cold ocean currents, the California current off the coast of Western US, the Labrador current off the Northeastern coast of North America, and the Peru current off the West coast of South America. Again, keep in mind how, why these currents flow. They are flowing because, again, this is Mother Nature's attempt to balance out the imbalances in temperature across the globe. Air is one way that it happens, and the flow of water is another way that it happens. This is a satellite image of the Gulf Stream. It's like a river of warm water that flows past uh, North America, 
and then here it is on its way over to Great Britain. So it bring, brings, brings, it brings latent heat energy to these areas, which again moderates the climate. Uh, and you can see it's much warmer here. The redder the color, the warmer the, the water is. So that's why if you go to the beach in these areas in the summertime, it's like bath water. And then here's that Labrador current coming down uh, from the polar regions. And there's that area off North Carolina that's known as the graveyard of the Atlantic. This is Ullapool, Scotland, in the northern part of Scotland. I was there in January of 2005, and I was, you know, we thought that it was going to be just barren and gray. And we get to this spot, there's no snow, and there's green grass everywhere. Now, in the mountains, there were snow, and, and it was kind of drab looking, but down here, just totally, uh, totally green and lovely. And that's the influence of that North Atlantic drift. And this is on the island of Skye. Uh, here are the mountains. You see they're snow covered, but down here there were sheep grazing. It was just lovely. We were there on Christmas, at Christmas, and it snowed. And they were so happy that it was snowing there. They, they told us we were good luck that we brought them snow because they rarely have snow at Christmas. But that, again, is that moderating influence of the North Atlantic drift. So here's where we were. Um, here is Scotland right here. Let me, let me go grab my pen here. Here's Scotland, and Skye is uh, off the coast of Scotland to the north. And if you come over, if I could draw a straight line, Look where we would be if we were over here. We would be in northern Canada, and it would be so it would be bitter cold, and it would be snow and ice covered compared to what's going on here. And um, again, it's because of that moderating influence. Can I say that time and time again? That moderating influence of the North Atlantic drift of the uh, of the Gulf Stream. So there are upwelling currents too. Uh, upwelling currents form when surface water is swept away from the coast by Coriolis or by offshore winds, as uh, happens off the coast of California, and it allows this colder, nutrient-rich water to replace the warmer water at the surface. So the Peru current and the California current. Can you see the water being dragged away from the shore here um, due to in this case, it looks like the wind, but Coriolis would cause that to happen too. So let's talk about the Peru current and the climate impacts of, a, of something that I know you've all heard of, but maybe you didn't understand how it forms, and that is El Nino. El Nino happens um, on an interval of every three to seven years, and it's changes in the Peru current off the west coast of South America. It's responsible for changes in temperature and precipitation worldwide. So, you know, it's hard to think, well, okay, just one current, a change in one current can cause the whole world to have these changes. But when you think about the Pacific Ocean, it's a huge ocean. And when we have pressure variability in the Pacific Ocean, that's going to influence climate. So what happens is the normal flow of cold water off the coast is cut off by this warm countercurrent flowing back toward the coast from the Western Pacific. And it impacts the economy because that warmer water means that there aren't gonna be as many fish hanging out there. So the fishermen in Ecuador and Peru, they know that around Christmas time, they are gonna be all, uh, out of work for a little while until everything equalizes again. That's where the term El Nino comes from because this phenomenon happens around Christmas. El Nino is the boy child, so it's like uh, uh, representing the, the Christ child. So La Nina is the opposite of El Nino. It's a phenomenon of unusually cold sea surface temperatures in the equatorial uh, Pacific, and it occurs half as often as El Nino. So with that, we get warmer winters in the southeastern U.S. and colder in northeast U.S. So let me show you a diagram of this. This is the normal situation. Hold on a second. 
Yeah, that's the normal situation. So we see where that polar jet stream is located. It's in a, on a more northerly track as it should be. Here's that subtropical jet stream. Here's that cold water. Here's Coriolis uh, here uh, deflecting things to the left in the northern, in the southern hemisphere in this cooler water that comes up. And we have fish that like to hang out here because of all the nutrients that are located here. So there's a strong trade winds. These are the northeast trade winds. These are, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, these are the southeast trade winds. These are the northeast trade winds. And together they brush this water. They cause this water to be moved over into the Western Pacific. So what we have, because of the cold water over here, we have higher pressure. Remember cool temperatures, air is heavier and it's denser, so putting more weight on the surface, so high pressure here. And it's usually dry as a result of that. No precipitation over here. Uh, the Atacama Desert, the driest place in the world, there are places in the Atacama Desert where rain has never been recorded. Then over here in the Western Pacific, normal conditions would be low pressure, warm water, low pressure, plenty of rainfall, we have rainforest here, so plenty of rainfall, and that's the normal situation. The fishing is good, uh, everything is working out well for everybody. And then what happens when it does a switcheroo? Now every year it does a switcheroo because of that warmer water that's stacking up over here, flowing back. So that's the El Nino event. But sometimes, not only do we get uh, this change in the water temperature, but we get this pressure difference. And that isn't called El Nino, it's called El Nino Southern Oscillation because the pressure oscillates from what it normally is. And uh, we just abbreviate that ENSO, E-N-S-O, El Nino Southern Oscillation. So this is what happens. Those trade winds weaken, and then this strong countercurrent is able to flow back and, and be even stronger than, than it is normally. So most of the time it's going this way, but now here it is, it's able to flow back, and it's where that water is st uh, stacked up over here, so it all flows back. So that warmer water cuts off that flow, and then the pressure from one side of the ocean to the other changes. So now over here, we have high pressure. Over here, we have low pressure. That subtropical jet stream does a more northerly, uh, has a more northerly movement to it. And that's when we start getting all this moisture in California that's coming from Hawaii. So those atmospheric rivers are referred to as um, uh, pineapple expresses. And that's when we can have major floods. There was flooding in Napa, Oh, in the uh, early 90s, um, or I shouldn't say early 90s, it was around 1999 or 2000, terrible flooding around here. Um, so we have to be careful. We have to make sure that gutters are cleaned out, that culverts aren't uh, clogged up because we know we're gonna get a lot of rain during these events. Over here, it's dry. Uh, one year that this happened, there was a plane that crashed into a mountain that was trying to land somewhere in Indonesia, and there were these forest fires in the rainforest uh, that obscured the mountain, and the plane hit it. I don't know why they weren't flying with instruments, but apparently they weren't. And then over here, it can be flooding. So that's a totally different, um, uh, totally different conditions from what normally happens here. The polar jet goes more to the north, subtropical jet deviates a little bit northward, and again, we get these atmospheric rivers. So nobody understands what causes this to happen. Is it the strong counter current that weakens the trade winds, or is that it the, it the weak trade winds that cause that, strong, that stronger counter current? Those are things that climatologists are trying to figure out, but we know when they're gonna happen because we have satellites and we have buoys in the ocean 
So in February of 2015, uh, 2015, a satellite detected this warmer water flowing back. We thought we were going to have a pretty intense El Nino. We got some heavy rains at the beginning of January, but then it kind of petered out. And then you see a couple of things to point out here. Here's the warmer water. This was the 1997. Maybe that was the year that it uh, they had all those massive floods around Napa and Sonoma. Uh, and you see this warmer water. So that allows these tropical fish will follow the warmer water. Sometimes they're catching those billfish off of San Francisco that you would normally find just off of Baja, California and Mexico. But they follow that warmer water northward. This was 2015. There's one of those atmospheric rivers headed toward us. Um, that was, you know, we were in, in drought, so this was bringing much needed rain to us, but then it, it kind of tapered off later on, and we still ended up being in drought. Well, so there are upwelling currents, and there are also downwelling currents. In areas of accumulated water, the excess water will move downward in a downwelling current. And these flow through the world's oceans, and they play a huge role in the global climate system. It starts in the polar region, so around Greenland, where more ice uh, forming means that there's more salt. Um, salt makes denser water, and that denser water begins to uh, sink into the ocean. Uh, and one of the problems with global warming is that more ice melting flowing into this means more fresh water coming in. So it could conceivably cut off the flow, the start of that downwelling current. If you've ever seen that movie Day After Tomorrow, that was the whole premise of that movie, that the downwelling had stopped. So climate around the globe was going to be, uh, was going to be changed. So there's deep ocean circulation. Oceans are layered. Um, the bodies of water will, the, the layered bodies of water with progressively denser layers going deeper. The water density is generally increased by lower temperature, so colder water will be denser, and by increased dissolved salt content, as we talked about up around uh, Greenland. So deep ocean flow is thermohaline. Thermo means heat, haline means salt. Um, so deep ocean flow is, uh, is deep ocean water flow starts as a result of that downwelling in around Greenland. Ocean water has a higher density in higher latitudes because of lower temperature in the Arctic and Antarctic because fresh water frozen in sea ice makes the water silt, uh, saltier. So when water freezes, the salt is left behind. The densest ocean water forms in the Northern Atlantic Ocean and the Southern Ocean. And we know this because we've been analyzing the salinity of oceans since 1957. So here it is. This is a heat transport mechanism. So here's the downwelling that starts. And this, this one whole trip takes about a thousand years. So here it is, it sinks and then moves into the Indian Ocean and in these uh, lower latitudes, uh, the water warms up. So part of it rises and begins a trip back. Part of it, part of that water continues on, on the bottom of the ocean, near the bottom of the ocean, and then picks up, warms up here in the Pacific, and then completes that circulation over a period of about a thousand years. And that is responsible, again, for climates, for the stable climates that we have. But if we, if we start tinkering with this thermohaline circulation, as we're doing with global warming, then things could drastically change. There's just another view of it. So what about ocean waves? Ocean waves are caused by wind blowing across the surface of, of water. And wave height is influenced by wind speed, how high is the wind, what's the speed of the wind, and by fetch, 
Fetch is the distance over open water that wind blows. So the more open water that water has to move, then the higher the waves can be. And we have different types of waves. On the East Coast, we have what are called spilling breakers. So it's all fairly gentle, unless it's a hurricane or something. You know, you go out and you can frolic in the waves like this. Uh, kind of different on the West Coast. We have in some areas, what are like around Mavericks and certain areas around Hawaii, we have what are called plunging breakers. These are the ones that surfers like because they get into the, the tube formed by the wave plunging over, the top of the wave plunging over the other part of the wave. And these things can be humongous. Surfers are probably the best meteorologists ever because the professional surfers follow weather religiously because they want to know where the storms are brewing that could generate these massive waves that they all want to, you know, have a chance of, of riding. Everybody's trying to break records for the highest wave that has been surfed. So rogue waves, fact or fiction? Well, it turns out that they are fact. Sailors used to come into port, probably still do, with these outlandish tales about these monster waves that, that they would see. And for the most part, physicists were you know, disbelievers with this because it was thought that the waves of this type from an average uh, sea surface should only happen every 10,000 years or so. Uh, so they got classed in these same old um, uh, seafaring fables as sea monsters and, and mermaids. But there was some um, businesses out there that knew that there was something going on and they wanted to find out. And it's these container ship companies. You know, these container ships, these big ships that haul all the containers filled with laptops and cars and clothes and food and everything in the world that we use, one of them on average disappears off the face of the earth a month. One a month disappears off the face of the earth and nobody ever sees them again. So over a 20 year period, there are 400 ships, including super tankers and container ships that have sunk, leaving absolutely no trace. Um, so they wanted to know why, because they're losing a lot of cargo. Never mind the people that they're losing. They're losing a lot of cargo. So they enlisted the help of the European Space Agency uh, with their satellites to look for these areas on the ocean where these monster waves might be, find, uh, might be um, forming. And in over 30,000 images covering a three-week period,